This is Ask Lisa, a podcast to help people understand the psychology of parenting. Psychologist Dr. Lisa Damore, author of two New York Times best-selling parenting books, takes your questions. And I'm co-host Rena Ninen, a journalist and mom of two. Some of what we talk about comes from raising children ourselves. Most of the time, I'll be getting answers to your parenting questions. So send your questions to AskLisa at drlisademore.com. Episode 75, How Do I Help My Teen Deal With College Rejections? Oh boy, it's that time of year. People find out oh what <laughs> school they got into. <laughs> And didn't get into. I didn't get into. Oh, That's yeah. a big you know one. that I've been living in this this year. I know you have a senior. I you do. found out early decision. What has this year yes. been like? Well, she got in where she wanted to go early. So, Rena, I'll tell you, we got off easy, and and I'm thrilled for my kid. And yet, you know. The beat goes on. I am very aware of kids who are not getting outcomes they want. I'm hearing from my kid about, you know, what's happening with all of her friends. Rena, you know how sometimes we say, it's a lot? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a lot. I know. I know. And I'm a horrible test taker. I mean, I'm the Indian kid who would never get into medical school or law school because I'm so bad at test taking. Well, I don't know if you're bad at test taking, but you're in the right job. (laughs) So back to these college students, Lisa, I've got to say, um, we got this letter and I, I'm realizing now doing this podcast, how many parents are in this boat? And it says, dear Dr. Lisa, my son just learned that he did not get into any of his top college choices. He's been admitted to three solid schools and I'm sure he'll be fine at any one of them. But how do I help him deal with his disappointment in the meantime? Also, to make matters worse, one of my son's classmates got into one of the schools my son really wanted to go to. My son has known this kid forever and can't understand why he got in and my son did not. What should I say to my son about that? Please help. Thank you. I'm guessing this parent is the only one going through this right now. No, I think I think this parent's in a very large club. Um, And admittedly, we're talking about families with the kind of privilege and latitude that let them go to college and also apply to lots and lots of schools for college. So we are talking about privileged problems. But for the families that have them, this is very painful and very real. Yeah. So how do you deal with this disappointment? Because this is like a major chapter of your life, right? It is. And it stinks. I mean, it stinks, Rena. And I think part of how you deal with it, you just turn and face it. You just say, yeah, Mm. man, this did not go down the way you wanted it to go down. And because we love you and we want you to have what you want, we're bummed too, but bummed on your behalf. You know, we know you'll be a great adult. We're not worried about that at all. But yeah, you had your, you know, your heart set on a few places and just the chips didn't fall the way we wanted them to fall. And it's lousy. I mean, I think just saying it. And mm-hmm. and the thing is, we have this kind of corny saying in psychology, like, if you can name it, you can tame it. Oh, I like that. It's good. And it's good for times like this because, you know, if you're like, no, I'm sure it's fine and you're like, you'll be okay. You know, if you're doing all that, the kid's like, okay, this is actually bad. Yeah. Whereas if you're like, yep, this stinks, you know, and it sounds like they did the smart thing in terms of how they did the admissions process where he has good options anyway. You know, I've sometimes seen kids, you know, apply to four ambitious schools, trusting they'll get into one of them, and then one safety school, and mm-hmm. then they're stuck with the one safety school and have no options. So the boy has choices. And one thing that can help if they have the resources and the time is if he hasn't seen the schools. And a lot of these kids have actually not done a lot of touring of these mm-hmm. campuses because they've point. been shut down. Yeah. One way to recover from this moment is to be like, man, this stinks. Like, buddy, I get it. I'm so sorry. You know, you're going to be okay. I know you're going to be okay, but that doesn't make this feel better. But then to go visit the schools he got into. And, you know, Rena, there's something kind of beautiful about college campuses, end of April, early May, you know, if, if this is available. And what it does is it can pivot attention away from what you didn't get to what you can have. And... Colleges are amazing. All colleges are amazing. And in the abstract, we can get really caught on certain colleges or certainly, you know, very, you know, well, you know, high reputation colleges can have a lot of power in our minds. 
But if you go to almost any college campus in the U.S., I mean, these are extraordinary institutions, whether they're highly ranked or, you know, the kind of names people throw around. Mm -hmm. They're wonderful places. And, you know, for most high schoolers, they're like, okay, this is pretty cool. May not have been my first choice, but I can get behind this. Mm -hmm. I also find that people forget you've got the option of being able to transfer. I know it's a pain, but sometimes it's easier to get into other schools once, you know, you've sort of started. And and so it doesn't mean like if you don't like the school, you're wedded to it for four years, right? Absolutely. And I think that is something that you can say. You can say, look, why don't you, why don't we go, if we can, check out the schools that you're into, see if you can find one that really feels like it's, you know, rings your bell. And if you get there and you're not happy, you can take another swing at this. And one thing I think parents don't always appreciate is that a lot of high schools, public, private, parochial, the college counseling staff will continue to work with you post-graduation. So oh, really? Yeah, that it's worth asking. If, you, if your kid gets to college and is unhappy, it's worth going back to your kid's high school and saying, can you help us with another round of applications. And, you know, they may say no, but a lot of them will do it. And so it's okay to um, to put the possibility of transferring on the table. And the way I usually see that play out, Rena, is that early days at, an, at college, a kid may be like, this isn't where I want to be. I'm going to transfer. And they start the transfer process. And the transfer process happens, you know, on a different timeline than the regular process. And they may even get in to places, and then they often have a choice about whether to leave or stay. And this is all very extended, and they've now been at the school for a lot longer. A lot of kids end up staying where they were. Um, either they've made friends or they found, you know, where they want to be in that school. But what's kind of neat about it, Rena, is if they decide to stay where they were, they like it better because now they chose it. Now they feel like, nope, I decided against that school that I thought I wanted to go to, and I have decided to stay here. So mm-hmm. I would even say to parents, if your kid's thinking about the transfer process, be open to supporting it, because it doesn't mean they're transferring. It may help them feel better about where they are. Mm, that's good to know. I got to ask you about this kid who got in to the school that he really wanted to get into. That's painful, Lisa. That's hard. It is. And this, I mean, this is like, a constant. I mean, I would say there's not a high school in America mm-hmm. where this isn't going on with a decent percentage of kids. And what's really hard in these moments is, you know, seniors know each other pretty well. I mean, do you remember by the time you're a senior in high school, you kind of have the drop on everybody? Yeah, <laughs> you know truly. what I mean? Especially if it's a small town and you guys have gone to school together since, you know, elementary. Yeah, definitely. Exactly. And so sometimes kids are like, wait, him or her? Like, why <laughs> would you take that kid? And I think the pivot that is so hard for kids to make is to understand that the criteria colleges are using to decide who comes are very different criteria. They're working with very different data than the high schooler is working with. So The high schoolers are working with information about, like, how hard that classmate works or what it's like to be with that classmate or how they measure up against that classmate on whatever yardsticks the high schooler is thinking of. The college is picking who they need to fill various roles at the school. Mm. And that's the thing that parents should start to make very clear to their high school juniors, that... When you are applying to college, yes, they ask you for this set of things that you can control, your grades, your scores, your extracurriculars, or whatever. And you may be quite dazzling on those things. These are what we ask of you to produce. When the college admissions office is sitting there trying to figure out who's coming, they're like, all right, we need a 6'5 kid for crew. (laughs) And we need (laughs) someone to fill the oboe chair of the symphony. And we need enough kids from the Midwest, and we definitely need more kids from Hawaii this year. We've been really, you know, kind of low on that. That they are coming in with this set of putting together a class that fills the needs of the university. And the needs of the university should be honored here, right? They want a diverse class in a million ways. They want kids that represent a wide range of backgrounds, a wide range of geographies they're coming from, and then a wide range of skill sets so that all of their classes that they need to have 
populated get populated. So the kids are taking the subjects that are being offered. And so it may come down to things like what that kid's major is mm, wow. and what that kid said his major would be. And that may be the thing that worked for him <laughs> getting mm. into the college and just didn't happen to work for the boy in this letter. And so high schoolers, they're not thinking in that way because they've always been measuring themselves against one another. And then a whole new set of criteria are at work that are often pretty opaque to them. And so it just makes them feel really bitter is the bottom line. Yeah. That's the bottom line, Rita. But can I tell you, you explaining this to me about the different things that colleges look for makes me feel better. We're going to pause for a second, take a quick break. And then I want to ask you, you've really enlightened me about the do's and don'ts of, of what you say to parents and what parents say to other parents about the college process and where your kid didn't and didn't get in. So I want to ask you a little bit more about that. We'll be right back. You're listening to the Ask Lisa podcast. Hey, Ask Lisa listeners, it's Rena. If you're looking for a new podcast, you should check out another project I'm working on. It's called The Hidden Economics of Remarkable Women, or HERO. HERO is a limited series podcast from Foreign Policy with the support of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We asked the question, could empowering women in the workplace be the simplest way to boost the global economy moving forward? And if so, how do we get there? So come along with me as I talk to women all around the world in places like South Africa, Nigeria, and Pakistan, women who are changing the status quo in surprising ways. You can find the second season of The Hidden Economics of Remarkable Women wherever you get your podcasts. I hope you enjoy. Welcome back to Ask Lisa, The Psychology of Parenting. We're talking about what do you do when your kid didn't get into the college of their choice. Lisa, you enlightened me when we were, you know, we do these Instagram lives on Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern where parents bring questions and, and we get to talk to the community. And I had asked you something about your daughter getting into college or something. And it, you helped me understand as a parent who does not have a child near the college process, there are things you do and don't say to a parent who's going through this process. But what about a parent whose kid didn't get into the school they wanted to. And now you've got to deal with everyone who's wondering about the school your kid got into. Yeah. <laughs> right. Then there's that. <laughs> then there's the public facing side of this. So there's the misery in your own kitchen, right, with your unhappy kid and helping your kid understand, look, the reason that kid got in has nothing to do with what you did or didn't do. The college chose what they needed. They would have taken you. They will take as many kids from a high school as they want. You were not up against that kid. It is what it is. Um, okay, so then there's the neighbors, right? With, the, oh, what's happening with, mm -hmm. let's say this kid's name is Bobby. What's happening with Bobby? Okay, so the first thing we have to remember is these are well-meaning questions. And I think sometimes people can feel like the question is, did your kid get into a fancy college? I'm very curious. Often the question is, I've watched Bobby grow up his whole life. I love that kid. I am invested in that kid. And because I care about that kid, I'm very curious about his next step. You know, often it's quite neutral. And I think we want to remember that because it doesn't feel neutral in our homes and it doesn't feel neutral in our hearts at these moments. And so I think where they are right now, they may say, you know, he's got some great choices and still deciding. Like that's as much information as anybody needs to know. Um what if it's a nosy neighbor though, Rena? One who mm -hmm. makes it weird, right? Who yeah. is like Oh, Bobby is so amazing. Is he going to Harvard, Yale, or Princeton? You know, like something <laughs> awful like that, right? And then, then the parent's in a bit of a pickle because the person has actually made this strange. I would hope no one would ever actually say anything like that. But if it's something along those lines where it feels there's a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of checking to yes. see if, you know, there is a dazzling outcome, I think then the parent has to absolutely stick up for their kid and say, you know, he is going to a school that is the perfect fit for him, and we could not be prouder. Right? Like, wow. that's the end of that conversation. Like, oh just my God. that's Wait, a great way to do it. Stop, hold everything. He <laughs> is, this is a great line. He is going to a school that is the perfect fit for him. I love that because you know what? I love these lines you give us because it's like, holding a grenade in your hand and you figured out how to defuse it before the grenade goes off. So I love Lisa language. Lisa language is my oh, favorite. Well, it's so good. You know, it's, I'm much better at probably generating it for other people than in my day to day. But <laughs> if I can be of use, I'm very happy. No, and I think just, and we're so proud of him. 
And then you just end it. Like, you make it clear, like, we're not having this conversation anymore. And then, then there's, of course, the interactions, especially as parents around or adults around high schoolers, would we meet a college, a high school senior? Like, we meet a high school senior and we're like, oh, you know, and of course, the first thought on our mind is like, where are you going to college? And like, just don't, right? Just don't. And, um, and again, it may be coming from that place of like, because I've known you your whole life and I'm just excited about your next step. There's nothing judgy or measuring behind this. So so give me some Lisa language because, you know, I was just at my alma mater, GW, last month and excited meeting with seniors and uh, excited about what their plans are next and realizing, you know what? I didn't know what my plan was until six months after I graduated from that school. Well, what's language when you know you're dealing with a senior in high school going on to college? What can I say that keeps it open-ended and doesn't put pressure on them about schools? That's a great question. Um I think we can ask questions like, what, do you, what are your plans for the summer, right? That's a perfectly reasonable question. Or what are you planning to study, right? And they may say, I don't know. So that's great. You can go in with eyes, you know, wide open to all the possibilities. Um, I think those are great ones. Um, you know, if you do end up learning more about where they're going to be, you know, just add, like, oh, Nashville, that's such a cool town. You're going to so enjoy this, this, and this. I mean, just be where they are. The most important thing, Rena, on this one is what you don't say. Yes. And here's what you don't say. And this, I really feel strongly about this. Do not tell kids that college is the best four years of their life. Oh, my God. I do that um, all the I, time. <laughs> I do that all the time because I love college. I'm like, oh, my God, this is going to be the best four years of your life. I say that to everybody. Okay, don't do that anymore. Okay. <laughs> and here's why. Here's why. Because first of all, for a kid like this who didn't get in where they wanted to go, now that feels even worse. Like, well, they were going to be the best four years if I'd gotten in where I wanted to go, but now they're just going to be four years, right? So you won't always know if that's in the background. But then the other thing is, they're just the next four years of a kid's life, and they're going to have good days and bad days. And, you know, at my experience, I was very stressed through college, Rena. Like, I, I liked college. Mm -hmm. I... um. I would go again where I went. I, I was very, you know, it was it was the right place for me, and, and I was lucky to get in. But I, um, I also knew I was going to grad school in clinical psych, and and the preparation for that is actually weirdly demanding. Mm -hmm. And I also was underprepared for my high school. So for me, college was actually a pretty taxing experience. And I, I don't know if I had it in my head like it was supposed to be the best four years, but if I had, I think that would have made the taxing aspects of it that much more unpleasant for me because I would have thought, oh, man, these are supposed to be the best four years, and actually I spend a lot of the time feeling a little yeah. overwhelmed. Yeah. And so that means it's all downhill from here. Like, that's the worst, you know. So I, I just think to say things like, you're going to learn and grow. You're going to meet kids from all over. This is a really cool opportunity, and um, I know you, you're going to make the most of it. You know, something like that that can be really heartfelt and kind. The other thing I just want to say on the positive side of this, Rina, it has been so beautiful to watch my daughter's cohort be so good to each other through this process. Mm. You don't and, always and get sometimes that. Yeah, you don't, right? Sometimes you hear about the more cutthroat side or this, you know, this boy in this letter, his understanding disappointment. But I have to tell you, you know, when in my daughter's friend group, and I don't think she's in some very unusual group. I think this is a not rare thing. When kids are getting in, like their friends are posting these beautiful montages, celebrating them, you know, so happy, so excited. And and I just, I always want to give voice to how good teenagers are and how kind they can be. And yeah, there can be some ugly stuff around college, but I would tell you, based on what I've been able to observe, we hear about the ugly stuff, but I think it is vastly outweighed by a lot of decency and kindness and mm -hmm. heartfelt celebration yeah. of any variety of outcomes. That's so nice to hear, so nice to hear. Um, I'm just curious, though, what else do you think we can do to help kids with disappointing outcomes? Well, here's how I think about it. And then let's, let's see if we can come to some language about how to talk to kids about it. Um, you know, I think we get the idea, teenagers get the idea 
that there are these outcomes that we're trying to get to, whether it's like a fancy career or making money or something like that, and that there's a straight path that can get us there. And often kids have put the schools they want to go to on that very straight path. But Rena, like, you know that's actually not how most adults arrive mm-hmm. at their midlife experience, right? Like, it's mm-hmm. a windier path than that. So when a kid's feeling really down about a college outcome, I think often what's behind it is they're like, oh, man, I was knocked off of my trajectory. Like, I had this plan, and now, you know, step four in my plan has been disrupted. I won't get to the steps down beyond that. And so the more we can disabuse kids of that idea that there's this straight path to these glorious outcomes, the better. And one of the best ways to do that is to get teenagers to ask people adults they respect about their first job. <laughs> this is a really, really, real, yes. And it is so helpful because if you think about it, Rena, this is a really interesting dynamic that happens for teenagers. So I'm 51. Um, you know, my daughter's off to college. Her friends are off to college. I'm mid-career, right? Like I've mm-hmm. been able to do the same thing now for a long time. And so, like, I'm, I'm good at it, right? Like, I've had yeah. time to get good at it. And same for you, right? Like, you've been doing what you've been doing now for a long time. And yeah. so you're established in your skill set. And what we have to remember is that teenagers don't see what happened between point mm. A and point B when we were 18 and now when we're, you know, mid-career. And so they, they miss all of the kind of messiness <laughs> that, yeah. that occurred. Good point. And so, the, yeah, it's really interesting. And so I think the more that um, we can introduce into conversation how windy people's paths were, you know, like, oh, you know, that so-and-so, our friend, you know, Mark, who you love. Yeah, you know, he's a really good lawyer now. But you know what his first job was? He was a waiter. He was a waiter. And and then after that, he did this. And then after that, he did that. And, you know, and he then he was like a DJ for a while. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, like, I think I think the more um, we can pull back the curtain yeah. on the um, the actual path that people take to, you know, if they're happy in their midlife, you know, the actual path they take to that point. Um, it's a great gift we can give young people. So something that um, have some of those stories ready, maybe. If and and really go for the adults that your kid respects in your That's community great. to help them see how long that journey was. That's so good. And I, I want to say, you know, it's something that First Lady Dr. Biden made me realize. She says it's the best kept secret, which are community colleges. What we're trying to do is help young people cultivate themselves to grow and learn. So so long as people are growing and learning, that's what matters, right? People can go to Ivy League schools and not grow and learn, and people can go to wonderful community colleges and grow and learn and cultivate themselves tremendously. You know, I know we're talking sort of about the end in colleges, but I got to tell you, I I still have a pit in my stomach throughout this episode of thinking about my kids who are in elementary school and the long road ahead. How do we take pressure off early on, on this whole college process? Because I hate it. I hate it already. I I just Mm -hmm. feel like we've got to rethink it. You know, I don't like tests. And it puts so much, is this really needed, all this pressure? How do we get them in the mind frame so they don't have anxiety over this whole college process? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 uh. Well, okay. So I've got bad news and good news. Oh, you know, no. part of it is like you can do it all right in your home, but they're going to school with other kids. They like mm. it, it just it just becomes atmospheric. So there's an element of it that's very hard to insulate them from. But here's the key thing, Rena. So much of the college process pressure gets tied up with this idea of we want our kids to be happy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So psychologists have actually studied what makes people happy at midlife. And we use the definition of like well-being at midlife. And Rena, it's actually not professional success. And it's not being wealthy. No, it's not. I mean, it's kind of amazing. Like those are very loosely correlated. They're hardly correlated. It does matter that you make enough money that you are not strapped financially, that when we see, you know, people go from being below the poverty level to comfortably above it, like their happiness increases dramatically, you know, no surprise. Mm -hmm. But then that quickly levels off, you know, that as people become wealthier and wealthier, they do not actually become happier. Um, it's, It's a very flat line. So we've studied what makes a person, 
you know, happy or have a high level of well-being at midlife. And it's three things, Rena. There are three things that matter. So the first is that they have good relationships, that they, they get along well and have enriching, nurturing relationships. The second is that they do work that they find meaningful, that they, that they care about what they do. They feel that it matters. And the third is that they are competent in that work, that they do a good job of the work that they think matters. That's what makes for adult well-being. And you probably notice this, like, you don't need to go to college for those things, mm -hmm. right? Like, you can so do all true. of those things without a college degree. So true. Okay, so if we backward engineer that, Rena, which we have, you know, so what is it at 18 or, you know, 14, 15, 16 that gets you to these adult well-being outcomes? It's being a conscientious person, being a good person, like being honest and upright, like that builds good relationships. That means you do meaningful work, and that means you do it well. And so if you can focus on that, right, you want your kids to be, you know, useful and, you know, grown ups with good well-being, just focus on that. Like, are they upright? Are they decent? Are they honest? Are they, do they treat people well? If you put all your eggs in that basket, you'll get the outcomes we want for our kids. Mm -hmm. And they may go to college, they may not go to college. Like, there's so much room between here and there. But what we say is that we want our kids to be happy. This is how it happens. Mm. Wow, we went in so many directions in this podcast that I didn't think we were going to go, but it's been so helpful. Um, I mean, I'm not applying to colleges, but I feel better already hearing this from you. <laughs> um, so what do you have for us, Lisa, for parenting to go? I think for parenting to go, when we're talking with kids about college, whether it's our kid or somebody else's kid, scrap the name, scrap the prestige. Don't worry about any of that. Bear very much in mind that kids can thrive anywhere and they can also crash and burn anywhere. And what we really want to focus on is whether they're ready for college. Are they, are they going to get there and take good advantage of what's available to them? Can they take good care of themselves? And we want to tell them that's our focus. We want to say, you know what? Maybe this didn't go the way you want, but you're going to get there and you're going to soak it up and you are going to grow and learn. And that's the point. Mm. We sometimes forget the importance of what really is meant to come out of these life moments. Right? Yeah. So true. Oh, well, thank you. I a lot to talk about here and process. Um, and I want to say next week, we're going to talk about something I struggle with and have been struggling with for years. We've got an encore episode about how do you get your kids to do things without nagging them all the time? <laughs> I'm the biggest nagger, according to my children. So we'll have that next week. And um, I'll see you back, Lisa. I'll see you next week. Sounds great. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to subscribe to the Ask Lisa podcast so you get the episodes just as soon as they drop. And send us your questions to ask Lisa at drlisademore.com. And now a word from our lawyers. The advice provided on this podcast does not constitute or serve as a substitute for professional psychological treatment, therapy, or other types of professional advice or intervention. If you have concerns about your child's well being, consult a physician or mental health professional. If you're looking for additional resources, check out Lisa's website at drlisademore.com. We'll see you next week.